Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Tom Lenny. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at the college. Uh, one of the three main elements of the McFarland Center's mission over the last decade has been to foster much greater understanding of Catholicism and Catholic life from a global perspective. Our website initiative, Catholics and Cultures, whose articles and videos have been accessed by millions of people around the world and are used in classes here and in many other places, was the first element of that work. The Journal of Global Catholicism, which has attracted more than 51,000 scholarly article downloads, is a second element led by Professor Matt Schmaltz of the Religious Studies Department. And that work continues to be embodied in a forthcoming uh, major, or at least very large book, I'll say, that uh, Matt and I are working on with some colleagues here. Uh, and by uh, the addition of several great new faculty on campus whose work engages global Catholicism. So I think lots of exciting things happening for us. Today I'm happy to introduce to you all a new colleague who adds to that work even more. That's Father Brent Otto, who is a Jesuit, a researcher, a teacher, and a historian of, South, of modern South Asia with interests in comparative work that I think will help shift our thinking about the history of Catholicism in parts of the world that have not had the scholarly attention it deserves or they deserve. This is the first talk in the McFarland Center's, his first talk as the McFarland Center's Global Catholicism Fellow, a new position this academic year. Brent is not a stranger to Holy Cross. He graduated from the college in 2001 with an undergraduate degree in history and uh, I'm a little bit bashful to admit that I knew him then, only because it makes me feel very old, <laughs> but knew him as a student. Uh, but back then I would recognize too uh, what a great student he was. After graduating, he taught at the secondary level, teaching uh, before joining the Jesuits. As a Jesuit, Brent has studied in New York City, London, and Berkeley, California. He's researched in India, ministered in Mexico, Jamaica, Atlanta, and the San Francisco Bay Area. He's a PhD candidate in the history of South Asia at the University of California at Berkeley and in the very final stages of writing his dissertation. Um, he specializes in colonial and post-colonial South Asia with research interests in the social histories of race and caste differences in Indian Christianity, missionaries, and education. With a commitment to interdisciplinary work between social scientists and historians, Brent was engaged in several collaborative research projects that explore the lived religious lives of communities in India. He co-edits the Interdisciplinary Studies Journal, the International Journal of Anglo-Indian Studies. And given his expertise, I'm really excited to collaborate with Brent on uh, work that enhances the McFarland Center's capacity as we hope the world, a world leader in the study of global Catholicism. He's already contributed to that as managing editor of the Journal of Global Catholicism that I mentioned earlier and will guest edit a uh, future issue. Next semester, he'll teach a course in the history department on colonialism and Christianity. So I'm excited about the ways that I know he's going to contribute to the college. Also want to welcome his family and some friends from India who've come, Professor Atreed, who's come out of retirement even to be here with us today as well. So um, he begins today uh, his work by talking about Marian devotion in southern India at a major shrine that I've been fortunate to visit at least twice. And I have to say that uh, to be there at the annual feast some years ago uh, nearly overwhelmed my senses, uh, sort of blew my mind, even though it was the second time that I was there. So I know that you're in for a treat today. Um, please join me in welcoming Brent Otto. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank you, Tom, uh, for inviting me to speak on this topic, uh, one on which I've been doing both historical and ethnographic research for a while now. I'm also really happy to be here uh, at Holy Cross as a Global Catholicism Fellow in the McFarland Center. And even in my short few weeks since, um, since uh, arriving at Holy Cross, I feel fortunate to have met and converse with so many wonderful faculty and uh, students with whom I look forward to more conversations as time uh, goes on. I hope uh, this afternoon is interesting to you all and will evoke many questions. 
So I'm going to try to speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and leave 15, 20 minutes uh, for, for conversation um, at the end. Now today I'm going to speak about two things that we are often told to avoid talking about, religion and politics. And worse still, I want to talk about how politics and religion are inseparable uh, in both the past and the present. They do some fascinating things for and to one another, and they play out actually quite seamlessly in the lives of individuals on the ground. People of faith who pray, who make pilgrimages, who seek divine and saintly intervention in their lives. Such religious people at the grassroots also have political lives or are embedded in identities that are political, social, and ethnic. So religion necessarily matters to politics. And I'll address this in the past uh, through the Indian case in which I'll be talking about as well as in the present. This topic is also about a very universal figure to Christians and even to Muslims, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She is seen as a powerful saint, even named Mother of God in the early centuries of the church, later considered immaculate in her conception, that is conceived without original sin, and also is uh, presumed to have been assumed bodily into heaven rather than her body decaying after earthly death. And she has given various names familiar to many of us, such as Mother of Mercy, Mother of Sorrows, Queen of Heaven, Star of the Sea. This exalted place in Christian devotion that Mary attained has spilled over into the psyche of the practitioners of other religions too, who sometimes have seen her equating feminine goddesses in their own traditions. The same figure by a different name, perhaps, or she conveys a gentle and merciful aspect of the divine that they may have a hard time imagining attributing to the God at the center of their worship. Now we must keep in mind that in popular, on the popular and devotional level, religion is quite free and messy and unrestrained. Even when you have rigid local religious authorities who want to regulate what is orthodox and what is not, and even where there are prescribed rituals People bend them to their own devotion, to their own uh, symbolic language, to their own way of thinking and meaning making. And this is certainly in the, the case in India with the figure of Mary I will be speaking about. So I title this talk, There is Something About Mary, and there certainly is. She is an incredibly popular figure throughout the world and for Indian Catholics and uh, from every region, and for other Christians too, as well as some foreign Catholics who make pilgrimage to this shrine that we will talk about. Um, and that is to say nothing of the numerous Hindus and Muslims who also go to this shrine of Mary. So I would like to ask the question, what is that something about Mary? What is it that she does which is so appealing to Indian Catholics and many more besides. And is that something purely pious and devotional pertaining to the private lives and concerns? Or is it something with political importance too? Spoiler alert, I think I've already told you that I will argue that it is important politically, especially to being a post-colonial Indian Catholic a person of a minority community who nevertheless has a claim to belonging within the imagination of the nation. But because this devotion began centuries ago, this has to do with colonial history as well. A longer story about being Catholic in India uh, that this particular Mary can help us to tell. 
So my remarks um, this afternoon are going to be divided into three parts. First, I'd like to give you a sense of the story of Our Lady of Velenkani, the miracles and apparitions centuries ago, as well as a snapshot of today, a bustling devotion to Mary at the shrine of Our Lady of Velenkani, who comes, what they do, and so on. Second, I want to go back into the history and ask about the history in between the 17th and the 19th, uh, well, the end of the 19th century. What was happening at this, sh at this shrine? What was happening in devotion to Our Lady of Velenkani? We don't know much about it, and here I'm going to show you a contrasting example of a saint we do know a great deal about, uh, whose devotion was bustling in these same centuries, as, as much as Velenkani is today. And we are talking about St. Francis Xavier. And that is going to give us an insight into some of the political implications of Our Lady of Velenkani. And third, um, we'll come back to today and look at what our, our, our Lady of Velenkani is doing for Indian Catholics now, how we can understand her popularity, the rituals they engage, the annual feasts and the ways that people participate. Her political importance now is similarly great as Francis Xavier's was in the more distant past. So who is Our Lady of Velenkani? Um, here I will draw on oral history that only in the last 150 years or so has been committed to writing as well as I will draw on my own visits to the shrine for participant observation and ethnographic interviews with pilgrims. Although I won't get too much into the ethnographic bit. So Velenkani, uh, you can see this map on the right here, is located in the state of Tamil Nadu in the coastal area in the southeast of the subcontinent. It is kind of a satellite of a larger town called Nagapatnam, which is about four and a half miles to its north. It is a seaside location where life has historically centered around um, fishing and coastal trade. Farming and cattle grazing were secondary occupations in this place, mainly concerned with providing for the local needs of the people. Today, Velenkani has grown from a sleepy village into a major pilgrimage center where an estimated 15 to 20 million domestic and international pilgrims visit the Basilica of Our Lady of Good Health each year. So here you see on the map its location there in South India, about halfway down the Tamil Nadu coast. And this on the left is the Basilica all lit up at the time of the annual feast. And I think you can see that there are lots of people. There's a gathering crowd um, all around. As you can see on this uh, map, what was a former small village was just with just a few hundred families is now a bustling town. Um, these are, this is a map of basically all the shrine sites, all the religious sites. Um, there are numerous hotels and restaurants. They all serve visitors to a landscape which is now defined by the basilica you saw in the last picture, plus multiple shrines and churches and chapels, a museum, a processional path, the way of the cross, and numerous kinds of services, even counseling services and health services, which aid pilgrims in carrying out their devotion. The greatest number of pilgrims come for the annual feast days, um, which is celebrated on the 8th of September, uh, a date recognized internationally in the church as the Nativity of Mary. And um, the feast actually runs from the 28th of August through the 10th of September with noontime flag hoistings, nightly processions, special uh, communal prayers and songs, masses in at least five languages. So the origins. The radical transformation of Velenkani from Sleepy Fishing Village to a shrine town began as far back as the 16th century after two local apparitions and miracles 
were then followed by a third miracle during the 17th century, all of which were attributed to the Christian Mary, mother of Jesus. The story of Velenkani's transformation is also a story which links together Indian and Portuguese Catholics, colonialism, and the major events of the post-colonial global church, such as the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1854. Now, we don't have contemporary accounts still extant from these three miracles, uh, written accounts from that time, but instead a strong oral tradition that endured over centuries. Now, it does not mean that such written accounts did not once exist. For when the Dutch invaded Nagapatnam in 1660, which included the parish church to which Velenkani belonged as a mission, the Portuguese were expelled along with all missionaries and their property and records were destroyed. Thus, there may have been accounts of the miracles or other documentation to do with the annual feast or movements of pilgrims and things of that nature. Yet it is puzzling that scholars have not found mention of Velenkani in some of the other colonial uh, church and civil sources. The attempt to consolidate the oral tradition and promote this devotion beyond the region was begun by the church in the late 19th century. Uh, not surprisingly, following the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. The account which is most um, drawn upon is a history of the shrine written by a priest historian named Father S.R. Santos. And it was published first, I think first, in 1933, though I think there were other smaller internally circulated versions before that. And, uh, and uh, rewritten sufficiently and things were added to it and it has gone through multiple um, editions since then. Now the first, let's see, have I missed a page break? No, the first apparition, okay, here you go. The first apparition is said to have taken place at some point during the 16th century. A Hindu shepherd boy was carrying a pot filled with milk to sell to a man in Nagapatnam. And on the way he rested by a small pond, a tank in Indian English parlance. And a divine lady, appeared to him holding her child in her arms and asked him to give her some of the milk to feed the child. He complied and then he went along on his way. When he arrived in Nagapatnam, he told the man what had happened and apologized that as a result, the milk pot he had was no longer full. But when he took off the lid, the pot was in fact full to the brim with milk, replenished apparently by supernatural means. The second uh, <coughs> apparition sometime later is said to have occurred to a lame Hindu boy, the son of a poor widow who was selling buttermilk beneath a tree. Again, a divine lady appeared to him once again and with a child in her arms. And she also requested him if he would carry a message to a wealthy Catholic gentleman in Nagapatnam requesting that he build a chapel on this particular site dedicated to Mary. And the boy agreed, but he protested, how can I go all the way to Nagapatnam because I can't walk? And so she instructed him to get up. He got up and his legs were healed and he went on his way to Nagapatnam and conveyed the message to the wealthy Catholic gentleman. That man it is said, was unsurprised by the boy's visit because he had had a dream where Mary appeared to him and asked him the very same thing. Hence, the boy's visit authenticated for him the dream's divine origins, and he proceeded to build a thatched chapel on the site of the apparition. It became a place of popular devotion, particularly among Catholics, who interpreted this divine lady who and child to be none other than Mary and Jesus. Interestingly, both the recipients of these apparitions were Hindu boys in this peripheral village of Valenkani, not local Indian Catholics, not Portuguese Catholics from the big town of Nagapatnam. 
Both boys responded to the divine request with generosity, and for that they were rewarded with miracles. The healing of the second boy um, is given as the reason why Mary of this particular place is known, came to be known as Our Lady of Good Health. And people come to her uh, with devotion most of the time surrounding health concerns. A third miracle is said to have occurred in the 17th century, this time not in the village and not to Hindu children, but out at sea to Portuguese sailors who were caught in a terrible storm, were sure they would sink and die, and fervently prayed to Mary for her protection. The storm ceased, and they came to land safely at, at uh, Valencani on the 8th of September, the Feast of Mary's Nativity. Certain that Mary had answered their prayers and saved their lives, they knelt and prayed on the beach. Local people saw this prayer posture of kneeling as being a Christian practice and summoned the local Christians who showed them then this thatched chapel. The Portuguese insisted on expanding it into a stone church and as a way, as a way of giving thanks for their miraculous escape from death at sea. The new church was dedicated on the anniversary of their deliverance, so this particular Marian feast became the patronal feast of Our Lady of Good Health at Valencani. Now you might say, although just a little aside here, these two miracle uh, <coughs> stories, apparition stories, they sound very similar. And they may indeed be different tellings of the same story. In fact, if you ask pilgrims, tell me what you understand to be um, the story of Valencani, you get all sorts of different versions. I'm just presenting to you the sort of authoritative one that the shrine and the church and uh, church historians have kind of settled on. But these things are always living traditions. Um <coughs> Um, besides appealing to local Catholics, these miraculous occurrences had great appeal to Hindus as well. Actually, let me back up for a second. Here is the image of the statue of Our Lady. Um, this statue was given by the Portuguese, uh, apparently, in the 17th century. Uh, I, I can't say that there's anyone who would be able to really trace that. But in any case, this is a close-up of the statue in the shrine. We'll say more about her garments a little bit later. So anyway, besides appealing to the local Catholics, um, this had an appeal to Hindus as well. The Tamil uh, region of South India has a deeply rooted cult of Amman, a mother goddess, a fierce, fierce warrior conquering mother goddess. In her study of the sacred landscape um, of the Tamil country, historian Susan Bailey explains that some in Velenkani, including shrine officials, claim that the basilica sits on the former site um, of an Amman temple. As Our Lady of Good Health is known primarily as a healer or exorcist of maladies, she fits the paradigm of a fierce goddess and the qualities born by Amman. So it is likely the case that many Hindu devotees then and now either conflate um, <coughs> our, uh, um, either conflate Our Lady with Amman or else interpret Our Lady of Velenkani to have conquered Amman and sort of sub subverted her and triumphed over her. With the basilica and the increasing numbers of pilgrims, as something of proof of this cosmic conquest. This is relevant to the universal quality that is essential to the appeal of Our Lady of Velenkani today. Now, I need to share some history that is relevant, colonial struggles, changes of rulership between Portuguese, Dutch, English, and French in and around Velenkani that's relevant. So. Bear with me for just a minute. Okay. Although uh, Velenkani was situated near the commercially important port of Nagapatnam, which was also the hub of missionary activity along the coast, 
it lay on the periphery, the distant periphery of Portuguese India. And Our Lady's appearance there was marginal to the concerns of the colonial state. This marginality was further confirmed by the Portuguese decision to build a church dedicated not to Our Lady of Elancani, but to St. Francis Xavier, to the north of Nagapadnam's town center. Not a nod to the devotion to Valencani existing, but a saint who is much more important to the Portuguese colonial project. Nevertheless, it appears that a long-standing local devotion to Our Lady of Good Health began to attract Indian Catholics as well as many Hindus and then Muslims from across South India. If the miraculous intercession of Our Lady for the Portuguese sailors occurred in the 17th century, it must have been during the first half because in 1660, um, the Dutch invaded and expelled all the Portuguese and the missionaries, at least from the fort and Nagapatnam. Although the Dutch invasion forced the Franciscan missionaries to rebuild the church outside the area the Dutch controlled in 1662, they continued to serve the parish based in Nagapatnam, which included, within its territory, Velenkani and the mission church dedicated to Velenkani Mata, meaning uh, Our Lady of Velenkani. Uh, Velenkani not only became a separate, I mean only became a separate parish a full hundred years later, in 1771, when the Dutch, when Dutch rule was, was waning. By a, a decade after that, 1781, the British had completely defeated the Dutch and took control of the area, and that lasted, that British dominance had la lasted until independence in 1947. Now, Santos says very little in his small book about 19th century Velenkani, providing only something of an ecclesiastical history, a list of parish priests and, and so forth. Um, and I can attest to it, too, that from my own research attempts, church records appear to discuss the shrine only with respect to tensions which arose when, for example, ecclesiastical jurisdiction over the region passed from the Goa-based Portuguese padroado or patronage of the church to the Rome-based propaganda fide, the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. In any case, um, um, in any case, Velenkani isn't spoken of very much in the records. Hence, it's safe to say that devotion to Velenkani Mata remained mainly a local affair for most of the 17th century through the 19th century, since massive regional or trans-regional pilgrimages, uh, pilgrim flows would have had to be regulated in some way, organized by the state and church authorities and resulting in a paper trail. So this fact only adds to the burden to explain uh, Velenkani's wild popularity today compared to her apparent obscurity for at least two and a half centuries from the time of the apparitions and miracles that led to the establishment of a shrine today. So what does Velenkani Arokia Mata, Our Lady of Good Health, uh, her wild popularity today really look like. 15 to 20 million pilgrims come there annually. Not all at the annual feast time, a few million do. But as Tom and I and um, probably Brian and a few other people here can attest, that small village becomes extremely crowded and even outside of the feast time, it often is this bustling um, bustling shrine with people from all over. So at Valenkani, devotees from all religions, a large minority of whom are Christian, express their devotion in a South Indian and arguably Hindu style. They garland the statue. Oh. They garland the statue. They offer thalis before the altar of Our Lady. They purchase totemic offerings that represent the causes for which they are asking her intercession. For example, for, um, for example, a small silver or tin leg will be made um, and offered in the box of devotion for somebody um, 
experiencing sciatica and seeking a cure for that. Or for a couple seeking to conceive a child, they may offer a golden baby um, made and, and given in the box of offering. Others tie turmeric onto tree branches, usually suspended, you see that on the left, usually suspended in something that is meant to look like a crib, a symbol of their prayer for fertility. Commonly, devotees tonsure their heads as a sign of a vow taken, a vow fulfilled, or as a sacrificial offering. There are tonsure parlors outside the church for this purpose where they will cut off all your hair for 10 or 15 rupees. But rather than presenting the hair in the shrine before the statue of Our Lady, they normally put it into the sea a few hundred meters away from the church. Although the statue of Our Lady of Valenkani is not ritually bathed in Hindu holy substances such as ghee, clarified butter, um, nor is prasad offered in the same way as in many Hindu devotional rites, her statue is enrobed every day in a new sari, which along with other objects such as string, coconut, pieces, salt, candles, and more, then become holy relics to take home or distribute among relatives. Indeed, a change at the Basilica following the Second Vatican Council in the early 1970s was that the sari with which Velenkani Mata's statue was robed would no longer be blue, the universal color of Mary in the church, but instead be saffron, the holy color in Hinduism. Apart from the distribution of communion at masses at the shrine, in which an attempt is made by priests to restrict the reception of the sacrament only to Catholics, pilgrims otherwise are more or less allowed to worship as they wish, making the sort of offerings that they want. And on the one hand, some of the above practices push the boundaries of ritual acceptability, but on the other hand, they can also be interpreted as a proper level of acculturation of the liturgy and of devotional practices to the cultural context of devotees. And I might add that devotees are becoming more diverse in their own cultural bearings. Still, local Tamilians are probably the majority of visitors to the shrine, but as they bring North Indians and West Indians and so on, and, and as well as foreigners, each does their own thing. So what's the annual feast um, like? The feast of Our Lady of Velenkani is celebrated on the 8th of September. Now, in Catholic tradition, the feast is preceded by a novena, which means a nine-day spiritual exercise of prayer, sometimes fasting, and other other devotional practices leading up to the feast. At Velenkani, however, uh, the novena is actually 10 days, as is the customary duration of South Indian annual village deity festivals. Each day of the novena, with its various activities, is sponsored by a different uh, family or caste group. And this privilege is a matter of great pride and concern, and sometimes contest. As I have observed um, in the processions for Latin Catholic parishes um, in Kerala, their patronal feasts and so forth, where the various castes and communities that make up a parish perform their status, really, in these ritual processions. Um, at Velenkani, a similar thing goes on. Though it's no longer a village festival, but more a regional and even reaching to be a national one, the sponsorship of these days and the roles played by different groups in the daily processions and flag hoisting and things is also a performance of a ritual kind of status and a social status within the broader um, Catholic community. This phenomenon among Catholics is a reflection of the significance of this processional uh, culture among South Indian Hindus to caste status and position in the village social order. So anyway, the processions every day entail a number of typical elements. 
there are carts, or you could say kind of like palanquins, on which statues are carried in procession. A flag with the image of Our Lady of Valencuni, uh, a different flag every day, is raised at noontime. And at the apex of the flag, you know, reaching the top, people then are to make their petitions to Mary. Music, flowers, all of these things uh, are in great supply, even fireworks in the nightly processions. Hundreds of people are engaged as bearers of these carts, of providers of all the materials, the thousands of candles and garlands and so on, and the players of musical instruments. And they hail from all Christian castes and other Christian groups, as well as some non-Christian from the local community who have all traditionally had a part to play with this feast. Two days of the novena are sponsored by prominent families. And I happen to get to know <coughs> one of them. You will note a couple of people here will recognize uh, one of the people in this picture. Um, the 4th of September belongs, belongs, I use that word because that's how people speak about their sponsorship of these days. The 4th of September belongs to the Pereira family of Nagapatnam. And now is this duty and privilege is carried out by one of their wealthy relatives who lives in Tiruvannathapuram, the capital city of Kerala, quite a, quite a, quite a ways away. I have become acquainted with, um, with this relative during my time spent in Carroll in 2017. And so he now comes every year with his whole family to fulfill this, this uh, familial duty every year to patronize the procession at considerable expense. He carries on a tradition not only for the sake of his family, but also as a representative of the mixed race Anglo-Indian community of which he's a part, of which his family's a part. That, that their part, they have a part to play as well within this, um, within this now internationally famous Marian feast. But none of the fame and the grandeur of the shrine today really existed until the 20th century. So I contend that this is because of the politics of devotion. Our Lady of Valencuni was of very little importance to the Portuguese and subsequent colonial states. They did not encourage devotion to her because they were busy promoting Francis Xavier at the time. This is the Portuguese I'm speaking of. So this gets us into part two. So if the Portuguese appeared to have taken little interest in Our Lady of Valencuni, it was surely not because um, the colonial state cared little about religious devotions. It, um, in fact, on the contrary, the extraordinary attention uh, paid to St. Francis Xavier and his church and his body after his death, the written accounts that they cultivated, um, making note of the miraculous properties of his body, the ritual veneration and pilgrimage to his resting place in Goa, demonstrate the heavy investment the Portuguese Estado de India, their Portuguese state, as well as church authorities made to this saintly devotion. The question is, why Xavier and not Our Lady of Valencuni? For certainly, Mary, mother of Jesus, holds a much higher station in the communion of saints, a more powerful place uh, of intercession in the Catholic imagination then and now, and certainly also a more universal position in the faith. The answer lies with colonial and church politics, which work to elevate Xavier and render Velenkani Mata quite invisible, at least until the last century and a half. In her groundbreaking work of historical anthropology, The Relic State, Pamela Gupta painstakingly traces the afterlife, so to speak, of Francis Xavier. That is, the life of his corpse. Today, the body of Xavier is entombed um, to the right of the main altar in the grand Baroque um, Basilica Church, Bom Jesu, in Old Goa. It was constructed 
in the early 17th century, just barely preceding the canonization of St. Francis Xavier in 1622. Already the saint had quite a following. Cultivated by the Jesuit order to which he belonged and encouraged very greatly by the Portuguese authorities. Uh, the Portuguese promoted devotion to Xavier, certified the miraculous and incorruptible state of his body, and accounted for miracles done for devotees by his intercession. And they regulated periodic expositions of the body to the public for veneration and for pilgrimage purposes. This devotion to Xavier only grew over time, and yet the balance between state and church uh, intervention shifted, as did the state of Xavier's body, which in the initial decades appeared virtually incorrupt, resistant to normal decay, miraculously, but later deteriorated to a great extent physically, and yet without ceasing to garner devotees for the miraculous uh, powers they attributed to proximity to, um, to his body. Now, Gupta convincingly argues that the Portuguese, from the mid-16th century until the final end of Portuguese rule in Goa in 1961, tied the fortunes of the state to the state of Xavier's body. So to answer why St. Francis Xavier became so important to the Portuguese state and church warrants a little bit of background. When did the Portuguese arrive um, on the Malabar coast? 1498, with the first voyages of Vasco uh, da Gama. And they came with a royal mission, which was, um, which was to establish trade and spread Christianity. Now, although the Jesuit order to which Xavier belonged was only founded in 1540, scarcely within two years, they were on the scene in India. The first missionary, St. Francis Xavier. And with frenetic energy, Xavier established dozens of missions in South India, in the Moluccas, in Japan, in Macau, and all of this in only 10 years between his arrival in Asia and his death off the coast of China in 1553. Um, he had an unremarkable death from illness, not a martyrdom, not a death in the midst of some heroic act, and that stands in opposition to the very remarkable life that his corpse would then have. Xavier's body was buried first on this island off of China. Then it was removed three months later, attested as physically incorrupt to the Malacca Islands, where it was again buried and um, was then exhumed and finally returned to Goa. Um, again, incorrupt despite in the Moluccas having been buried with a generous portion of lime to hasten its decomposition. In Goa, it was uh, then entombed in the Jesuit College of St. Paul and uh, later in the big basilica church which was built. Now it's important to keep in mind that Xavier was the first Jesuit missionary sent abroad after the order's founding and that he was the religious superior in charge of the entire mission based in Goa which included all of the East. The Estado de India, the Portuguese state, meant everything, um, everything to the East. And, um, and similarly, Xavier had that uh, expansive mission in his religious um, purview. Keeping in mind that the Jesuits functioned in Portuguese India under the auspices of the state-run padroado, that is patronage, success of the Jesuits um, would appear to redound to the Portuguese state as well. And this might have been true as long as both the Jesuits and the Estado rested on stable ground. And funding was an important measure of that stability. Yet this stability was not to be uh, true for very long. For the first decades from Xavier's canonization, venera veneration of Xavier's body brought enormous crowds and pilgrims to Goa and filled the coffers of the new Jesuit church. The church might easily be confused, actually, if you go into it, 
with a temple to two, de- two deities, one that looks like St. Francis Xavier, men- memorialized in a larger-than-life depiction in a grand gilded side altar with statuary and paintings of him, and his works overshadowing his tomb, and the other uh, that looks like St. Ignatius, who in the place above the central altar where the crucifix typically would be found is also depicted in larger-than-life form with a hand pointing upward toward the heavens and above him depicting depictions of the Trinity looking down upon the earth. Jesus and Mary have little place in this edifice, which is clearly a celebration of Jesuit glory, particularly the miraculous St. Francis Xavier. This monumental celebration of Xavier at Bom Jesus Basilica um, all coincided with the pinnacle of Portuguese power in the East from around the end of the 16th century until the middle of the 17th century. However, as Portuguese power declined for a whole vari- you know, s- variety of reasons, such as the rise of the Dutch and the English, <coughs> um, English trade and naval power, the power of Xavier or the Society of Jesus in India did not follow a downward trajectory. In the 1660s, the Portuguese lost most of their Malabar coastal ports to the Dutch, a final nail in the coffin already being prepared as a great share of their trade siphoned, uh, was siphoned off to the English as well as to inland domestic markets further up the peninsula and away from, um, uh, away from the Portuguese uh, kind of um, uh, coastal trading ports. So in any case, the Portuguese retreated. They consolidated their power in the one place that they held, um, held directly and uncompromisingly, and that was Goa. At this point, we see kind of the sharp edge of just how important Jesuit success and particularly the popularity of devotion to Francis Xavier um, and his, his relic, his corpse, was to the Estado de India as the success of one and the other slowly became unhitched due to changing geopolitical and economic fortunes, which rendered the previously described imbalance. So what I mean is an imbalance between Jesuit power and Portuguese state power. There was something of a symbiosis, and this became uh, dis, uh, moved into disequilibrium. Uh, why is this all um, important? Pamela Gupta study traces the state of the Estado paralleling the state of the body of Xavier and the manner and conditions of its periodic veneration, contending that the state saw the relic's power as an essential source of legitimation and of patronage of the Portuguese Empire in the East. Conversely, the deterioration of the corpse tracks alongside the very real deterioration and declines of the fortunes of the state, which responded with efforts to downplay the saintly relic's decomposition, or else to recharacterize or rebrand its supernatural qualities. Um, the historically consistent anxiety uh, by the Estado about the state uh, of and control over the body as a legitimating and divine patron is shown to have endured right to the bitter end in 1961. As the Portuguese withdrew from India, they attempted to take the body of Xavier with them back to Portugal and were ultimately prevented from doing so by the people of Goa. How could a new ruler come to power in Goa without the sacral legitimation of its patron, Francis Xavier? Thus, the mantle of power, because Xavier's body remained in Goa, passed from a colonial to an indigenous power, from the Portuguese Empire to the Republic of India. But this radical change was balanced and reconciled through the continuity of Xavier's presence and thus his cosmic patronage of the state. Though the purview of Xavier's patronage would appear to be curtailed uh, post-1961 to just that of Goa, he remained a comforting presence 
that bridges one era with another. In the Basilica, um, the story um, of the edifice and its quite bombastic Xavier-centric adornments beg to tell a different story of a larger-than-life saint with supernatural energies in both life and of death, worthy of emulation, worthy of supplication. And yet more than once during my short visit, I was asked by visitors, who is this guy? You know, who is this guy? Whose grave is this? What did he do? So Catholics, even attending Mass, there are not immune from this diminishment of Xavier in the public imagination. Xavier, therefore, appears to have indeed been evacuated of a good deal of his power, a power which is codependent on the attention of devotees, just as the Portuguese evacuated their long-held colony over 50 years ago. Um, all you've just heard about Xavier's importance to the Portuguese colonial state and to go in Catholics Hold it in your mind as we now let it instruct us about what had been happening to Our Lady of Velenkani and Catholics in more recent times in India. A similar level of post-Vatican II adaptation of devotional acts, symbols, and so forth that we talked about earlier, seen at Our, Sh Our Lady of Velenkani Shrine, is not really seen at the tomb of Francis Xavier in the Basilica in Goa. People come to the tomb of Xavier. They do not uh, bring offerings except money, which is put into a box near the tomb. People kneel or stand and pray for a while. Others will visit the tomb before or after Mass. There is little veneration of any statue of Xavier, and one cannot reach far enough even to touch the bottom edge of the coffin. There are no holy relics to take away from Xavier's tomb neither by organization of the authorities nor by any others. People do make vows, for sure, to come to the shrine for prayers answered, but tonsuring, for instance, and penitential approaches to the basilica are not practices one observes there. Xavier was a charismatic figure in life and a miraculous agent in death, yet he was a foreigner whose arrival, whose life, and whose afterlife was colonial. He was also a Latin Catholic, a Roman Catholic, whose missionizing made converts to Latin, right, Catholicism. The Portuguese with whom his legacy is inextricably uh, affiliated had sought to force the existing Syrian Christian community into the Latin fold, into communion with Rome and under the Pope's authority. The Portuguese, with whom his legacy is inextricably uh, linked, um, sorry. So anyway, thus, under his the long shadow of colonialism and the nation's collective attempt in recent decades at decolonizing Christianity, could Xavier ever hope to sustain the cosmic power and devotional magnetism that for so long had been attributed to him? This is where Our Lady of Velenkani comes in. She has never been a colonized saint, nor a colonizing one. The Portuguese colonial church, the Padroado, had paid little attention to her devotees or to the shrine itself. Neither had the propaganda fide and its clerical oversight in the later colonial era, at least until the late 19th century, when the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was promulgated and began to fuel Marian devotion and pieties. This would, it seems, um, have made Velenkani Mata the perfect uncolonized saint for a decolonizing India and post-colonial Indian Catholics. This Mary is Indian, not the traditional Western representations of Mary, but Mary's manifest apparitional and miracle working self in Velenkani who appeared first not to Europeans but to non-Christian Indians. When Francis Xavier had been the missionary of uh, colonial Latin Christianity, one could claim that Our Lady of Velenkani was a supernatural bearer of Christianity to India, not the Apostle Thomas 
proclaimed as the ancestor of the Syrian Christians, and not Francis Xavier, claimed mostly by low-caste colonial converts to Christianity, but someone heaven-sent to all the Christians and the non-Christians alike in South India. It would seem that Velankani Mata was the ideal saint to be patroness for India's Christians, or perhaps even more, a universal mother to all Indians in the post-colonial, post-Vatican II imagination of the late 20th century. So while once the once glorious shrine complex in Goa with the Bom Jesu Church and its surrounding churches, chapels, seminaries, and convents, they now all kind of stand as a shadow of their earlier selves. Much of it is now controlled by the Archaeological Survey of India as objects of arcane historical and cultural preservation. The town of Velankani, however, is the opposite and on an opposite trajectory. The once sleepy fishing village has become a bustling center of devotional life. The 19th century church, the one um, you saw in an earlier picture, the basilica, um, which was uh, designated a basilica in 1963, remains the center only because the statue of Our Lady of Velenkani is installed inside it. Physically, however, it has been added onto, affording a larger church uh, space for mass. A whole crop of other chapels and churches have been built, many in recent decades. Um, you see one enormous one right here. Marking out a sacred geography where each part of the apparitional stories are said to have taken place. There is, for example, a tank chapel where the buttermilk boy rested by the tank and was appeared to by Mary. And then there's the apparition chapel where the apparition to the lame boy is said to have occurred. Then there's a one kilometer long processional gravel path leading to the basilica on which pilgrims often make the journey on their knees, bloodying their knees as they make a penitential journey to the uh, basilica, praying the rosary frequently enough. That path is lined by the Stations of the Cross. In 2013, an enormous new church, seen here, Morning Star Church, was erected. It is shaped something like an airplane hangar. It, com it is said to accommodate 10,000 worshipers at once. This new church sits beyond the apparition chapel at the far end of the processional path. And even at that distance, it dwarfs the old basilica. There's a counseling center with psychologists and spiritual directors, a prayer garden sponsored by European governments. Hostels, hotels, and eateries abound. One hears numerous languages as pilgrims come here from all over India and from abroad as well. In early 2019, I could hardly believe it when acquaintances began to circulate on WhatsApp, pictures of a new giant statue of Jesus Christ constructed at Velenkani. What is to this, um, what is to this shrine town something like a skyscraper, really, um, like a skyscraper is to a big city? I immediately assumed that this was digital doctoring in the um, seldom true WhatsApp um, uh, media ecosystem. And yet, it wasn't. I was wrong. Indeed, there had been an impressively large statue of Christ installed on the soil of his mother's sacred shrine, 75 feet tall, <coughs> and claims to be the largest representation of Christ in Asia. I immediately thought of the much larger recent statue of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, which had been erected by the Modi government at exorbitant expense in Gujarat. You see it on the right. The former, a divine figure. The latter, a political figure. But both are, in a sense, sacred figures in the sacred narratives of Indian Catholics and the modern state of India, respectively. Were these statues erected by authorities with similar intentions in mind to assert the legitimacy, their legitimacy, through monumental representations of a sacred figure. Perhaps. 
though why construct a titanic statue of Christ and not of Mary in the middle of a Marian shrine? For that matter, why would the BJP opt for Vallabhai Patel in Gujarat and not perhaps Savarkar in Maharashtra? It would more align with the politics of, um, of the present government. I can't answer, answer these questions satisfactorily, but they confirm for me the enduring currency of sacred and saintly figures, their narratives, monumental and spatial, spatial representations, and the attraction that they have to devotee peregrinations. And all of that, very important to the legitimation of both church and state. Just as the colonial uh, Portuguese required Xavier's miraculous uh, body, the Indian state today <coughs> looks to a nationalist figure, even whose ideals um, are decidedly at variance with the current government's predominant ideology. It nevertheless tells a story of continuity, that the Indian independent republic belongs, you know, uh, the current government is in this line. Just as the colonial church cultivated Xavier to be a powerful devotional fulcrum of its missionizing, the post-colonial Indian church seems to have turned to an uncolonized Mary who specially chose to manifest her power to Indian non-Christians centuries ago and to today's devotees who seek her powerful intercession. But in any case, any in, uh, in case anyone would forget, not because she was a goddess in her own right, not the Hindu goddess Amman of Tamil devotion, but mother of the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, whose statue may now stand as a reminder of this essential Christian qualification to what could otherwise simply render Mary an accessory to the powerful South Indian goddess cult. In 2011, the Indian Railways initiated a new train service called the Vasco Valanconi Express, carrying passengers <coughs> from Goa to Valanconi direct. From the old Catholic devotional hub of colonial India to the new Catholic devotional hub of post-colonial India. So it seems that the Indian railways even, of all the republic's organs of government, had its fingers firmly on the pulse of the rapidly shifting ground of the tiny Catholic community's devotional trends and was willing to capitalize on it. The state's connection with the sacred shows itself to be ever ancient and ever new. And that's all I'm gonna say. And I thank you for your attention, and I welcome any questions you have.